All right. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for coming out tonight to the uh, Santee City Council meeting of uh, Wednesday, March 22, 2023 at 6.30 p.m. Uh, tonight, uh, we're dressed a little differently. We're getting ready for the Padre season to open, so we thought we'd uh, dress up a little bit just to uh, give them a little bit of a nudge towards where we want them to be and support. So if you see, so that's that. That's it. And um, so let's see. Tonight, the uh, Pledge of Allegiance will be led by Savannah, and um, she will do that right after we do the uh, invocation. And tonight's invocation will be given by Pastor Jerry Phillips. And let me tell you just a little bit about Pastor Phillips. Uh, Pastor Jerry represents Sunrise Church in the community. He leads the Sunrise Partnership with the Santee Food Bank, leading a team of Sunrisers on the third Tuesday of every month, helping the food bank hand out commodities to the many families in need of food. Working with the Santee Food Bank on the third Saturday of each month, Pastor Jerry leads a team of college and career students that pack groceries to be delivered by a team of drivers. They deliver groceries to the homes of over 60 shut-ins within our senior Community, mobile home park community. Much needed, much needed, appreciated. He also serves on the board of directors of the El Cajon Pregnancy Care Clinic and is a strong supporter of the East County Transitional Living Center. Pastor Jerry's pastoral responsibilities at Sunrise are valued and loved. Pastor Phillips and his wife have been a part of the Sunrise for over 20 years and have been a part of the pastoral team since April of 2019. In 2001, Pastor Jerry received his Bachelor of Science degree in business management from the Christian Heritage College in El Cajon, in El Cajon. So thanks for keeping it local. <laughs> when he's not in church, Pastor Jerry's favorite things to do are long drives with Pat. How do you feel about that, Pat? That <laughs> sounds good. And if memory serves me correctly, you also like golf. Yes. And watch ice hockey on TV. And how about the Padre game? Did you watch that last Big night? Big Padre fan. All right, then. And uh, so not to mention you're also watching your grandchildren play sports. So we thank you once again for being here, and uh, we ask that you pray for our nation, of course, our state, and our council. Thank so you. please. And that the Padres always beat the Dodgers. And that the Padres <laughs> always massacre the Dodgers. Thank please you. rise. Savannah, come forward. And you'll Thanks. be ready when uh, Pastor Jerry's finished. Thank you. Thank you for the honor to pray. Most awesome and wonderful God, we just thank you so much, Lord, for this meeting tonight. We thank you for every representative of Santee. We thank you for the people that are in, in our community. We thank you for all the workers of, of our community. We thank you for our first responders. We thank you for our nation. We pray, God, that you keep our nation safe and sound. We pray for our state, God, that you'll keep it strong and, and safe. We, we pray for our county, God, that you will bless every area of our county uh, from, from, Santa, from Santee to the, to the ocean, from Santee to the, to the mountains and deserts. Father God, thank you for this great and wonderful night that we can talk business. We pray, Lord, that you'll guide us, direct us, and lead us this evening in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jerry. Yeah. Can we pull a microphone out for her? Please follow me. I pledge allegiance to the flag, to the flag United States of America, and to the Republic, which is one nation. Under God, invisible, liberty, and justice for all. Thank you, Savannah. <laughs> all right, that takes us to a recognition of Savannah Johnson. Uh, for her do do donation of Girl Scout cookies to the City of Santee Firefighters for the third year in a row. And 
That presentation is going to be done by Councilman Trotter. Yeah, you can come up and if you want to take pictures. Yeah. Come on uh, up, Mom. You, you don't have to do it from back there. Turn around. I'm going to face that way, okay? So, you guys, said so tonight I get the honor to uh, give Savannah Johnson a certificate of recognition for an amazing young lady that, for the last three years, she's brought a donation of Girl Scout cookies to our Santee firefighters to each, um, each house, basically, so uh, Station 4 and Station 5 for the last three years, right? How many, uh, how many cookies? Twenty. Twenty to each station? That's pretty good, keeping these guys uh, fed out there, you know, every year. So real quickly, I'm going to read this uh, certificate of recognition presented to Savannah Johnson in recognition of her, the kindness and support you have shown to the Santee firefighters for donating Girl Scout cookies to them for each of the past three years. Thank you. And actually, I would like, I'm going to give this to you. And I actually want all the firefighters to get up here and take a picture with this young lady. I know a couple of you guys have had a chance to do so in the past when she got delivered cookies. But since we've got everybody, so many of you guys here, why don't we take an opportunity to do so? So you're right up front. Turn that thing around. <laughs> don't be shy now. <laughs> Everybody in there? Yep. Thank you, Savannah. Look at all these guys that you helped out. Want to try and pick out which one ate the most cookies? <laughs> Thanks, Dustin. All right, that takes us to our agenda and the consent calendar. Any items be added, deleted, or reordered? Ron? None. Oh. No. No, sir. Have any? Yes. None. No, sir, Mr. Mayor. City manager. No, sir. City attorney. No, sir. City clerk. Sir, I have a speaker on item one, two, three, five, and six. Okay, let's go ahead and call. But actually, let me uh, yeah. do uh, take a motion to approve all the uh, remaining. I'll make Jeez. that motion. Okay, I have a motion. I'll second. I have a motion, second. Please vote. Four and seven. Yeah. Four and seven, yeah. Yeah, four and seven. Motion carries unanimously. So, item one, truth. Okay. So, here I am again to oppose this same unethical item that proposes to approve ordinances on the agenda by only reading the title, waiving the state law requirement to read their contents in full. The public will inevitably be deceived into thinking you council members pass something that sounds good, but maybe in name only, because without the fine print, they'll never know. A book naively judged by its cover, a contract with city government signed without having a clue as to what's really in it. The excuse given in this item is for this new unethical direction is, quote, such reading could substantially delay the meeting and limit the time available for discussion of items, end quote. So I'd say if the reading of ordinances really lasted that long, which y'all know it doesn't, then it's clear that those ordinances are too long for the public and for you council members to be passing in the first place. Did you ever think about that? Maybe they just shouldn't pass them if they're that long. I ask, how did give me liberty or give me death turn into give me convenience and give me death in just a couple hundred years? So shout out to my friend Bryant for that line. Uh, most times, the hard road of extra work and extra time spent is worth it to make sure things are done right. And when you've got the people of the city of Santee's lives and futures at stake, why wouldn't you commit to ensuring due diligence for them? This item also says, quote, 
State law requires that ordinances be read in full either at the time of introduction or at the time of passage, end quote. Honestly, even reading it only at the time of passage is a rather crooked state law. So I ask, why would you council members want anyone to even remotely suspect that you're trying to hide something by not reading the ordinance's contents? It's better to reject this item and give people a reason to trust your words, actions, and ethics. Thanks. That's it for that one. Item two. Motion on one. Hey, you want to vote? Motion to approve. Second. All right, motion to approve. Second, please vote. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Mayor Mento, you voted yes. Just, just keep going. Okay. And after each vote, we'll just get to the next item. Mm -hmm. Item two, truth. Okay. So for the record, today's agenda is 365 pages long with eight items in consent. This item number two luckily did not include a bunch of frivolous spending. That is great news. So the only questionable spending item I read was... Branded tablecloths from Impact Canopies USA that cost $1,295. Pretty good. But uh, speaking of tables, Laura, don't forget, a seat at the table with the devil only provides rotted fruit to eat. <clears throat> mm, I don't know if I should say, like, Girl Scout cookies earlier, and they're not exactly healthy, but here's a joke. This is a joke for reward for not wasting our money. That's the firefighters, I think. Good on that item. Motion approved, item two. Second. Please vote. Motion carries unanimously. Item three. Hmm, I don't see the timer, but I could just go if you want. It's when you begin speaking. It always has. Okay. Good to know. In this item three, over 96000 has been spent for legal services, including over 18000 just in litigation and claims. Frivolous litigation and claims, including two. Affordable Housing Coalition of San Diego County at a cost of over $465. And Climate Action Plan litigation at a cost of $204. For special projects, community-oriented policing is wasting over $5,700. And an item that only reads cannabis is costing over $1,100. The details are unspecified on whether or not the city of Santee will be buying plants or buying pot shops or paying for more policing around the pot shops or spending money on consultants or what. Staff needs to be specific on what this kind of charge was for, because that leaves some serious questions there, much like not seeing a timer. Under third-party reimbursable, we have over $5,800 from Michael Grant's Lantern Crest, the guy who couldn't even defend the fact that our record number of EMS calls are coming into his facility. At the February 22nd meeting, he could only spit out something to the effect of, I'm willing to spend as much money as it takes to have more resources rather than address the fact that seniors are experiencing way too many falls at Lantern Crest. That may have something to do with the lack of an adequate number of staffing. And yet the building's expanding, so I imagine this reimbursement cost will too. But hey, over $5,300 from the redevelopment of Carlton Oaks Golf Course is pretty good. <laughs> Nobody got hurt in that collection. And lastly, the adopted budget was over $691,000. The revised budget is now over $821,000, not including an extra $90,000 in other funds. Is it raining? Is the rain falling into the money buckets? Or is it just an inflated budget? That's uh, it for that one. Motion. Motion to approve. Second. <clears throat> Motion carries unanimously. Item five. 
Okay. This item is exactly the same affordable housing fraud the county just approved on March 15th. The Housing Element Progress Report, program number 10, reveals this, quote, by right approval of projects with only 20% affordable units on reused sites, end quote. The staff report admitted, quote, the California Department of Housing and Community Development allowed rental and forced sell multifamily housing units, including accessory dwelling units, ADUs, to count as moderate income housing toward the jurisdiction's respective regional housing needs allocation. The city of Santee is taking the same approach. The city received five development applications and 15 ADU applications for a total of 3,222 last year. These units include the the 2,949 units associated with the Finita Ranch plan development. Santee's RENA allocation was finalized by SANDAG in 2020, end quote. You see, it's all about approving ugly accessory dwelling unit stack and packs that are beginning to tower over people's single family homes all over the county. And it's Sandag who approved these numbers, an unelected regional governance group who is supposedly concerned with transportation, and yet they have their hands in housing. Then there's program number seven, facilitate affordable housing development. The city engaged with three affordable housing developers. Program 11, The city will amend the zoning code to require the replacement of units affordable to the same or lower income level as a condition of any development on a non-vacant site consistent with state density bonus law. That means more people, more traffic, and program 12. The city will also explore other options to further encourage the construction of ADUs, pre-approved plans, larger unit square footage allowances, among other things. The financial statement also admits why this housing push exists. Quote, upon the filing of this report, the city would continue to be eligible for potential funding from a number of regional and state programs. End quote. You see, it's all about getting those state debt dollars. That's what I mean by money buckets. The general plan and housing element annual progress report that we've heard is not really for the public's knowledge. It's only a requirement to receive money from the state. It gives the state complete knowledge of land use, making sure counties and cities are implementing their planning goals. A monitoring tool of sustainable development. That's the United Nations Agenda 21 plan to get us all densely stacked and packed into smart cities without freedom of mobility. So I would say no to all control mechanisms implemented by people acting as puppets rather than as representatives like they're supposed to. You all know people want single family homes on land and safe neighborhoods. Isn't that why they move here? not because they want to live in a place mimicking North Park and its increasing stack and pack density. I'll make a motion for that one. I have a motion, is there a second? Second. Please vote. Did you get who made the motion in the second? Yes, motion carries unanimously. Next, item six. On March 25th, 2020, these city council members, with the exception of Robin Dustin, declared a fraudulent emergency declaration. The reality is that there was never any real threat to people's health or safety. More people aged 18 to 45 have died from fentanyl than ever died from COVID. All of you could have ended this charade a long time ago. But you've enjoyed those American Destruction Plan Act debt dollars at the expense of our country's financial stability, hence increasing inflation. Thanks a lot. Most educated people quickly found out about the global pandemic exercise called Event 201 held in October 2019. That was sponsored by Johns Hopkins, the World Economic Forum, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, where they proposed, quote, governments partner with news and social media. Public health agencies like the CDC should work in close collaboration with the WHO. Media should ensure what we label as false messages are suppressed, end quote. Johns Hopkins went on to say in their September 2019 document entitled Preparedness for a High-Impact Respiratory Pathogen Pandemic, quote, non-pharmaceutical interventions we want in a pandemic, travel and movement restrictions, quarantines, social distancing, closing schools, canceling gatherings, teleworking, use of masks. These measures inherently limit civil liberties. But influential partners before, during, and after crises can be used to mitigate resistance. CDC has news media 
to sway people's choices when they fear a rushed vaccine. Big pharma and biotech companies will be our backbone. Nucleic acid, RNA and DNA based vaccines may not need extensive testing, end quote. That was all in 2019, just coincidentally well-planned and tested the year before these fraudulent emergencies and subsequent lockdowns that ruined people's lives occurred. Do any of you understand what you contributed to? Increased suicides, lost jobs and businesses, children not getting a proper education, people not able to visit their loved ones, and so much more. All for a virus that even renowned expert liar himself, Anthony Fauci, wrote in the New England Journal of Medicine on March 26, 2020, that, quote, COVID-19 may ultimately be more akin to seasonal influenza, a fatality rate of approximately 0.1 percent, end quote. There were never conditions of extreme peril to the safety and persons and property within the city of Santee, like such a declaration required. But those in government only cared about getting and spending those ARPA debt dollars, as well as implementing totalitarian price, property, and life controls. When you council members have kept this fraud going for longer than even Governor Gruesome, you should really be embarrassed and ashamed of yourself. You should have ended this. You should never even begin it. No further speakers. Thank you. Motion. Motion approve. Second. Please vote. Motion carries unanimously. That takes us to non-agenda public comment. One speaker, Truth. I can't believe nobody here has anything to say. That is crazy. Bad people and wrong things are what bring me back. Every single city council meeting needs to be uploaded to YouTube, just the same as it is available on the city website. So here are the reasons why I think that. Granicus software sucks. It plays choppy and it's slow. That's just the truth. Number two, most people don't visit government websites. People use YouTube and they like to leave comments. Number three, real publicizing of these meetings needs to happen via listed. That's with all caps, bold and underlined. Videos on YouTube, like other city and county governments do. Uh, and they also need to be available for download, because I'll tell you what, the San Diego City Council does that. And they upload it, I think, uh, the same day. Uh, so that's, that's how you would keep the public informed, engage, and engage with their representatives. Because you, as you can see, I'm the only one who has something to say in this whole city of 60,000 people. Something's not right. Now, I'd like to inform you council members of some online bullying on the city of Santee's Facebook page from a one Samson Osborne who isn't too big on free speech. It's almost hateful for him to want to shut me up. But I understand that little old me and my big brain and truth-filled mouth can be intimidating for some because actually reading 365 pages of city council agenda items in only six days or less and then writing speeches based on those facts and then speaking those words into a microphone is something that not just anybody can do. It's a good thing I'm somebody, and I need to put on the record that I don't give a flying crap what no name nobodies think. I'm a bigger fish in this pond than anyone here realizes. I'm a freaking shark when I want to be, but that's, you mostly haven't seen that because I, I really actually just like to laugh. I like to tell jokes, that's more my thing. But reading agenda items is boring and sometimes infuriating because the injustices often contain within them. So I can't always throw in humor, and I'm a creative writer, so I never know how things are gonna turn out. But if any trolls or babies feel insulted or even bullied by my comments, you just need to grow up, you're an adult. I have respect from those that matter, the people that realize how much work I put into this type of thing. For example, some of the council members here, and even for people in higher positions than any of these council members, believe it or not. I've even been on the radio. <laughs> And even recorded in the same exact studio that John did with Kyle Whistle many times. And nobody here knows it because I don't care. I don't speak looking for approval from anyone and I don't need it. I speak to broadcast the truth and to try to save freedom for everyone. Even for those that frankly don't deserve it, don't appreciate it. It doesn't matter 
because all of those haters are literally fuel to my speaking fire. And for the record, this city council is much better than this city. No further speakers. Takes us to item number eight. I'm sorry, uh, item number nine. Uh, public hearing on an adoption of resolution amending the Transnet Local Street Improvement Program for fiscal year 2023 through 2027, amending the Capital Improvement Program budget and finding the action is not a project subject to the California Equality Environmental Quality Act. Good evening, uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, City Council. Uh, staff is before you tonight with a public hearing um, on an amendment to the Transnet um, program. A uh, little background has uh, the audience and council would uh, would remember that uh, Transnet was created as a half cent sales tax measure as Prop A and approved by voters to add a half cent sales tax for transportation and other improvements um, in the region. Uh, City Council at a past council meeting approved the biennial basis of a five-year program that projects all the local projects and jurisdictions using the money that's generated by Transnet. Tonight, specifically, we're here uh, doing an amendment to that program that council already approved because every year SANDAG does a, uh, a review of those and they give us new projections every year. And what you see here for each year is the new projections. And keep in mind, these projections are actually net after debt service. Santee in 2010 and 2014 took loans against future transnet obligations for Forrester Creek and for paving projects back at that time. So these are the net result of those. Those will be paid back after 20 years. So it'll be 2030 and 2034. Then we'll see a, a significant increase in this funding year after year. Um, as I mentioned, the Two main projects we're actually amending tonight are the Pavement Repair and Rehabilitation SNT-02 and the Pavement Roadway Maintenance. Um, Council is very familiar with those. Uh, the Regional Arterial Management System, SNT-20, that is actually a regional management system we pay into. It's about $7,400 a year, and it, uh, SANDAG uses that money from each agency to program and do regionally significant uh, uh, monitoring and analysis of the, of the region as a whole. Um, other regionally significant programs are listed below. Those are also reported to uh, SANDAG. These are projects that are regionally significant as well, and we're required to report on them. That includes Transportation Improvement Master Plan. That's for signals, signal timing, different things that our Traffic Engineering Department does. The SR67 improvements at Woodside. Um, most of that is funded by RTCIP funding, not Transnet. Um, Prospect Avenue and Mesa Road. Um, that project will be coming actually for award at a council at a uh, very soon council meeting. I believe it's scheduled for April. Smart traffic signals. I know that's been a priority for council in the past. Uh, the traffic engineering department, we're starting to program some of that funding for future years to start looking at tra uh, smart traffic signals, mainly on the Mission Gorge Road corridor. And the Santee Town Center specific plan. This is actually uh, grant funding that we're required to add in the Transnet report as well. So just kind of a general background on the Transnet program itself. And as I mentioned, as part of the bold board policies and everything, we're required to do these public hearings and resolutions as a requirement of SANDAG. So with that, staff is recommending we conduct and close the public hearing and adopt the resolution approving the amendment to the Transnet Local Street Improvement Programs for fiscal years 23 through 27 and amending the Capital Improvement Program budget accordingly. And with that, staff's available for any questions. Thank you, Carl. Speaker slips? No speakers, sir. Thank you. Council comments or questions? Okay. Do I have a motion to approve? So hold on, it's, we're gonna this when we we're gonna come back and decide where these funds are going. Correct. Through the capital improvement program process yeah. and through other uh, workshops where we follow council's recommendation for the use of this funding. All right. And keep I'll in certainly. mind our emphasis on more roads being paved and in the neighborhoods. Correct. All of the additional funding that we do get, there's a little bit additional funding in each year. Exactly. One was a little bit less. All of that is going towards paving. Thank you. Okay, second by uh, Hall. Please vote. Motion carries unanimously. All right. Item number 10, which is a resolution appointing Jesse Bishop as Director of Human Resources on an interim basis and approving the employment 
agreement. I'm going to make a motion to approve that one. Any speakers? No speakers, sir. Okay. Is there, is there a second? Second. Second. You guys want to hear a report? Yeah, we're the city manager for a presentation here. Okay. I'm teasing. <laughs> All right, then. I have a motion and a second. Please vote. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. And that takes us to item number 11, which is a workshop on the multiple species conservation program. Uh, City of Santee suburban plan and finding that the workshop is not a project subject to California Environmental Quality Act. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, tonight we have uh, Pat Atchison here from ICF. They have been our consultant on the sub-area plan for a long time, uh, doing some very good work for us. We're hopeful that this project is going to be moving forward for culmination and adoption, should council choose to move that way before the end of this calendar year. I think Pat's presentation outlines the amount of years that we've been working on this. So we, this is just a workshop. There is no action required by the city council. And so I'll turn the mic over to Mr. Atchison. So my name is Pat Atchison, uh, working for ICF, and we specialize in putting together habitat conservation plans. And so like Marlene said, we've been working on what we're here to talk about, the Santee MSCP sub-area plan. So what is that? It's essentially, it's an effort to bring together and uh, a number of efforts into a coordinated citywide system of open space and that allows for protected biological open space along with parks and trails and a balanced build out of the general plan. And so some of the objectives are that you have a protected open space and this program will lead to take authorizations, which is essentially a, a way of uh, describing permits through the Endangered Species Act. And this program is designed to streamline that process and ultimately set up a, pro a program where you have enhanced biological corridors that are protected into the future. So a little bit of background, the Endangered Species Act uh, was passed in 1973 and over time has been uh, laying out a set of rules and regulations about how that Endangered Species Act gets implemented. And that has included the development of regional conservation plans, and we'll talk a little bit further about that as we go. California has a very um, uh, comparable parallel system uh, that was passed in 1970 for it, the California Endangered Species Act, and then in 1991 passed the NCCP Act, Natural Communities Conservation Program Act, and that lays out a process by which these regional conservation plans can be established. And... The way that these work is essentially you have, you have the state and federal agencies that are responsible for implementing your endangered species regulations. They issue permits down to the local agencies. So in this case, they would issue a permit down to the city of Santee, and then the city of Santee can use those permits for their own projects as well as delegate the authorization down to private developments. Um, this is a process that's been going on within San Diego County. Um, and back in the 90s, there was the what was called the San Diego Multiple Species Conservation Program, the sub-regional plan. And it covered the southwestern third of San Diego County. Um, and then the way it works is it sets out a framework by which each jurisdiction then adopts their own individual sub-area plan. And so a number of the other jurisdictions... Um, within the county have already adopted their sub-area plans and have been implementing this process of complying with endangered species regulations over the last uh, number of years. Um, so for Santee, actually, you know, began this process back in 1997 and was uh, developing a sub-regional plan at that point in time and then moved forward with getting a draft plan in the 2000s, and then when the recession hit, kind of the housing demand stopped and the program kind of got put on hold. It's come back up. 
we started in 2015 and we've been moving it forward and uh, um, we'll get to a public review draft here this summer. So a little background is like, what is a sub area plan? Essentially what you're trying to do is come up with a process that balances how you set, up, set aside conservation along with approving development into the future. And a series of benefits that you, we usually point out that come with these types of plans uh, that are from an environmental, economic, and community benefits. So from an environmental standpoint, the goal is to maximize the biological outcomes by protecting your larger blocks of habitat, protecting the habitat so it's connected and allows for corridors and wildlife movement, and then setting out a process by which those lands are managed and monitored over time in long term. Uh, from an economic standpoint, once this plan is in place, you're looking to streamline these regulations. So right now, when you deal with, deal with endangered species permitting on a project-by-project -project basis, it takes time. It's not always a clear, straight path. The goal is to provide that level of regulatory certainty and streamlined effort. You're not creating new obligations. You're just creating a new direction as to how those regulations get implemented. And the other economic benefit is that having these plans in place allows for the city to apply for grant funding for a number of other um, opportunities that are out there. And the city has put a, uh, you know, quite a bit of time and effort into this, and so their goal is to get this done and receive that return on this investment. And then from the community standpoint, having a sub-area plan in process or in place uh, fulfills a lot of the goals of the general plan to see that balance between conservation and development. And it's also going to be um, in sync with a number of other city uh, initiatives in terms of seeing the San Diego River enhancements and improvements, improve that uh, San Diego River experience, um, having a connected trail system and, and helping to uh, see and improve that process. Um, and then ultimately, there's benefits from the community standpoint of bringing this decision making down to the local level. So you're going to, so the community is going to be able to work with the local planners, have better communication, uh, better uh, experience in moving forward their projects than trying to work with state and local um, uh, environmental or um, uh, getting their permits through the state and local uh, agencies. So the way these plans move forward, you have to uh, identify specific species that get covered. Um, and so those are the uh, listed uh, plants and animals that are currently listed or likely to be listed by the federal and state agencies. Uh, so in, in the uh, city of Santee, there's about 20 species that sort of met that criteria. Uh, the Natural Communities Conservation Program also equally emphasizes protection of natural habitats. And so in Santee, you're looking at coastal sage scrub, chaparral, grassland habitats, and also uh, the riparian habitats. Um, and then, so we've gone through in the plan and began to identify all of the set of covered activities and c covered projects so that we are estimating how much future uh, impacts are likely to occur. So there's specific hardline projects. So these are projects that have known development plans. So there's a couple, Finita Ranch and Parkview, that are included in the plan as hardline projects. And we also have identified or estimated how much future development will occur as part of the general plan, but also based off some the sub-area plan conditions that are included. Um, and then there's other development and maintenance activities, including uh, roads and bridges, um, new trails and also maintenance of trails or maintenance of drainage facilities. All those are identified in the plan sort of sets out rules and procedures as to how those, those uh, impacts are addressed uh, and fuel management and, and defensible space. Specifically for the San Diego River, have a conservation strategy that emphasizes a trail system that will be connected around the north and the south 
uh, sides on along the edges of the river outside of the floodway, um, and then allowing a level of some additional future disturbance within the floodway, um, but those actions are going to still need to provide um, uh, for the conservation and no that loss of any aquatic and riparian habitat, and the plan identifies where there are opportunities for that uh, conservation and restoration, particularly of the riparian and aquatic habitats. So th within the plan, there's an overall conservation strategy, and it's kind of um, easiest to summarize that by looking at the, this um, preserve map that has um, the dark green are the hardline conservation areas. So those are the areas where we already know on these projects where they're going to have on-site uh, conservation, and those areas are going to be put into uh, preserve and managed as preserve lands. Uh, there will also be off-site mitigation for um, as part of this plan in the East Elliot and also up in, in uh, towards the Alpine area for helping to cover Keno and Hermes uh, butterfly impacts. Um, and then the yellow areas are the upland standards areas, so the plan will establish procedures by which we're, the city is going to make sure that there's a level of conservation, basically keeping to a 70% conservation within those, those uh, areas in yellow, still allowing development to occur, but in a managed way. And then, um, as we mentioned, specifically within the San Diego River, we've identified these conservation opportunity areas. And then also within Santee, there's existing protected land. So, and some of those are managed from, at different levels. They've been set aside as project mitigation or you have existing <coughs> conservation lands from Mission Trails Regional Park, um, other lands that have been acquired from conservancies. And so the overall, the goal of the plan is to try to knit those all together into one cohesive open space system. So we're linking up and tying in with existing uh, conserved lands. So what's going to come before the council is a final uh, sub-area plan. So that was sub-area plan document itself. And then a joint uh, uh, part of that will also be an implementing agreement. So because the state and federal agencies are delegating this authority down to the local level, there's a legal agreement between those entities and the city of Santee. So that, that implementing agreement is that legal um, document. And then uh, a CEQA document, an EIR, for, that addresses the sub-area plan and the adoption of the sub-area plan itself. And we are going to include within, as appendix to the sub-area plan, uh, two portions that are implementation that are a habitat loss and insult take ordinance that will lay out a permitting uh, process by which if a project comes in, it has direct impacts to natural habitat, you'll have to uh, get the ha uh, habitat loss and insult take permit, and the ordinance will sort of lay out that checklist and a cookbook as to how that permitting process will, will uh, occur. And then the general plan itself will go through um, some amendments to make sure that there's consistency between the sub-area plan and the general plan. So a notice of preparation was issued last Friday on the 17th. Um, we're having the public workshop here this evening. And then uh, next Friday, Thursday, or Thursday, sorry, on the 30th is an EIR scoping meeting. And with the... Um, uh, opportunity for the public to come in and provide written comments and we'll have boards and and people there to answer questions and communicate more about the, the details of the plan at that point and then work towards developing the document ready for public review along with the EIR in the summer and there'll be additional public workshops during that public review time period and scheduled to have a public hearing with a for final adoption, December 2023. Um, so, wanted to um, provide some insights of some of the, uh, the, the plan implementation steps and some of those costs. So, there's still going to be some work or costs associated with getting these general plan amendments together, additional meetings with the agencies, 
And then once a plan is adopted, there's also some additional time and support needed to, uh, for the agencies to turn around and issue a permit. So there's um, uh, some uh, support needed to get to the permits themselves. And then within that first year, um, you're setting up the process by which all of the city-owned lands that preserve lands will need to, the city will commit to doing additional level of biological monitoring and management. So you want to make sure that the weeds are under control, public access is under control, doing the uh, surveys for the uh, endangered species. Um, so the first year is sort of setting up that process and hiring a preserve manager that will do that work. Um, and then uh, setting up from a staff assignment for or a role that is referred to as a preserve steward. Um, so the preserve steward will make sure that there is coordination between all of the uh, preserve management entities. Um, and then going forward, that the city will also hire a preserve management entity so that that will facilitate any future projects that come in. They will know who or how to work with a preserve manager to conserve the conserve the lands that they need to set aside as part of their impacts. Uh, you know, and then there's other aspects of providing an annual report back to the uh, agency. So as you get the, they delegate the authority to you at once a year, you have to kind of tally up how many projects you've approved and let the, feed that information back up to the agencies. So that was sort of a quick over, <laughs> overview of um, a lot of, uh, you know, a, a kind of a pretty wide-ranging program, um, but open it up for questions at this point in time. Uh, do you want to go to uh, comments and then questions? Okay. Stick around. We're going to do our uh, public uh, comments first yep. and then uh, come back. We just have one speaker, Truth. So, mystery grant funding, huh? Here we have the City of Santee's Multiple Species Conservation Program sub-area plan. Of course, nobody here even knows what sub-area refers to, so let me provide some insight. This item says, quote, the plan would require land be set aside and managed for permanent open space at levels acceptable to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. The city has been working with the wildlife agencies to finalize the plan. The MSCP sub-regional plan is implemented through local sub-area plans, end quote. The translation is, the plan was never this city's idea, and nor was it the state's idea. This is the state entangled with the federal government, which only seeks to overstep its jurisdiction to fulfill the goals of a few politicians with personal control agendas, rather than the desires of people that actually live in the areas affected. And that's why you can find this same plan in other states, such as Arizona and Nevada. So what is this plan about? The item says, quote, the intent of the city's sub-area plan is to balance growth with the preservation of wilderness habitat, balancing the conservation of covered species with housing, property rights, recreation, transportation, economic development, and other community and regional goals, end quote. The short answer is a balance of our rights, the sacrificial communitarian ideology. Screw your freedom. That kind of sums up what that means. And there are two conservation areas outside of the jurisdiction of the city of Santee for acquisitions of 207 acres for butterflies and butterfly habitat. Now that's a great example of how fraudulent this program is because you know those butterflies just fly away from the land that was taken, kept away from human use and enjoyment like nature actually intended. And this entire multiple species conservation program doesn't even protect the endangered eagles from the toxic and flammable lithium based wind turbines that are killing golden eagles and bald eagles every year by the thousands in California alone. As I admits, quote, the plan analyzes up to 23 species that would be covered. These species occur in Santee or have the potential to occur, end quote. You see, nothing's guaranteed, nothing's real. The point of these conservation plans are really just to take away land for the public's use, whether that be for housing or for anything else, in order to fulfill the United Nations Agenda 21 plan to get us all away from suburban and rural areas 
in order to be able to more easily control us. For those of you who haven't yet read it, it's a document that's required reading to really understand what's been going on in this world. If you haven't read Agenda 21, you don't really know what you're looking at when you look at something like this that sounds like it's going to protect the environment. It's much deeper than that. Thank you. No further speakers. Thank you. Council of comments or questions? Okay. You know, what's that? Yeah. I have a couple questions. Um, there we go. Thank you. I, I know for the first one, I'm not sure if that goes to the city manager or who, but uh, some of these funds, it, there you go. That was the slide. Thank you. <laughs> some of the funds that, are, that still need to be paid and still will be coming up. Um, do we have the ability to claim some of these back in future developments, recap or recoup these fees? Yes, sir, we do. That's uh, part of what's being developed right now. There's a development impact fee study that's underway by the city. There's also future grants that could be available, as were mentioned in the uh, presentation. Um, we're also looking at ways to recoup on a cost recovery basis, like we do the cost of getting a building permit, those types of things. So we are looking at all of those avenues, and that is what we intend to bring back with our next workshop, which will be this summer before the city council actually has to do any kind of approval. Okay, thank you. And I was just, we're specifically looking at the initial year, initial year implementation at 325 of uh, pulling that into a grant application this summer. So a lot of this is, is really, it's, I mean, it's seed money to get, to get this going and to make this. Uh, yes. Yeah, thank you. And how many years did you spend out in our community looking for? the different species of animals and what was out there that should be protected and all that? So, um, I mean, we've, we've been back working on this in, started in 2015. Right. Um, a lot of the information that we're using comes from different reports that have been done within the city and, you know, as part of various projects that have been ongoing. Um, and then... And then we we sort of stitch all that information together and make sure that we're kind of going out and field checking, um, you know, making sure that the as as uh, you know the the development moves forward, we're kind of keeping the information as current as possible. Did we have any bald eagles during that time? No. No. We didn't have any to add in here. No. Oh, okay. Not, not in Santee. Not in Santee. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Quick question. Um, I think it's. Uh, Slide number 16, maybe. It uh, is a conserva uh, conservation strategy preserve system map. That's it. Now, when I look around um, the out, the beyond the border of Santee, um, my question is, um, San Diego um, and uh, the county, Do does any of that area that we see outside our border, uh, is it part of? An MSP, MSP, MPS, MS, MSCP. Yeah, MSCP. <laughs> Easy for you and to say. Conservation areas. Yes. Um, and, you know, um, we, we do have another map in the plan that does show the, the conservation of areas surrounding um, Santee. So certainly to the north is uh, um, the county's uh, open space. The Gooden the, public of the um, Gooden Ranch. Um, and that is part of the county's. Um, sub area plan and part of their protected areas along the San Diego River the areas towards uh, Lakeside have been an idea you know the, um, they are there's protected designation on the riparian habitat along through that area I, I'm actually not positive if those have been dedicated as officially part of an MSCP program or they're just conserved some there's it's a a distinction that each jurisdiction kind of goes through in terms of whether this land's enrolled or not. Um, as you go, Mission Trails Regional Park, as you go downstream, um, is part of the city of San Diego's sub area plan, but that little finger that kind of comes up in is not technically part of Mission Trails Regional Park. It's, it's kind of, that's sort of a no man's land of, of um, whether that, that portion is within the, it's designated as part of their, what's called their MHPA, so it's sort of their areas where they apply conservation rules, but they're, it's not uh, part of their MSCP protected lands. 
Okay. The reason why I ask that question mm -hmm. is because we do all this work, we create a uh, protection area, and then if it's not protected around it, That's right. what, what, what is the real advantage, I guess, is a good question. Or like was pointed out, um, you know, birds, butterflies, and everything can go wherever they want because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we can't control them in this area like others. And um, so... I just, I guess that's my question is, why would we even do this if it's not protected around us um, so that the, uh, you know, whatever's walking around out there is safe? Right. Right. So, they, so when you, when looking at what areas to, to put onto this map with these designations, we did look at what, how certain are we of the land surrounding Santee as well? And certainly, um, uh, you know, kind of the, the, the area north of the city um, is part of a large block of protected area, uh, both with Miss, uh, Miramar and the county. So, so trying to make, keep that connection to the north is, is an important part to what, the, what you want to see the conserved areas within Santee continue that, you know, make that connection because there is a level of certainty that you are going to see that conservation north. Now, as you go east, there is, that's more of private land that could be developed. And so there wasn't as much of the emphasis to create those, those, um, those connections kind of going more towards the east until you get to um, the lakeside uh, habitat conservation area. So the kind of directly <laughs> east from this, this area is protected through uh, an acquisition that's occurred um, in years past. So, so those key uh, off, you know, sort of outside of Santee, you're really working to make sure that San within Santee, you still are maintaining those connections. Um, okay. so, so there is that, so you are looking to see how what is the long-term protection of the areas surrounding the city as well? Yeah, I think that I might want to see one of those maps sometimes to yeah. see what we're up against. And because uh, if, if we're going it alone, and when we just look at this map by itself, it looks like we're going alone at it. Right, right, so right. that way others can know that there's other protections out there yeah. and uh, whatnot. Yeah. So. And, you know, let me go back to... This the sub area map, <laughs> if I can get, is, oops, I think it went past it, sorry. This, so surrounding Santee is the county has got their adopted plan and the city of San Diego has their adopted plan. El Cajon doesn't have much <coughs> habitat, that, so they haven't gone forward with their sub area plan. So the areas surrounding Santee have also been working to kind of create this sort of network of protected areas. Okay. okay. Anything else? All right. So I did have a similar question about cost recovery through development impact fees. And I know we're working on that. We've been working on um, that study for a while. Uh, what I see as an advantage for Santee is that this will save time. Uh, the regulations are the regulations, but having local control, there's, you know, that's the goal here. And it also um, helps mitigate the, the frivolous lawsuits that we see from the eco-extortionists um, with every development, it seems. And, and if we have our own plan, it, it takes the lawyers from Arizona out of our business. So I like where we're moving with this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Takes us to item number 12, which is a community risk assessment and long range master plan presentation. Finding the action is not a project subject to the California Environmental Quality Act. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, honorable members of the council. This is a project that started almost a year ago where the council took action to approve funding for a third-party consultant to come in and do a comprehensive 
analysis of really all of our services that we provide through the fire department. Uh, not just do an analysis looking retrospectively, but also come up with some robust recommendations for how we can move our department forward into modern day standards. Um, Clay Stewart is here on behalf of AP Triton. Uh, they produced a pretty robust report that was a significant portion of the entire packet. So 240 pages of his report are really what caused probably the, the more extreme size packet than normal. Uh, so I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Stewart from AP Triton who are really, um, they are experts in the industry and, and do this for agencies all over the nation. Thank you, Chief. <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, uh, Council Members, thank you for allowing you me to come. Get closer to the microphone. I can. Thank How's you that? And also raise the uh, dais or lectern. I mean, no, I can't. On the side. Was oh, that it? I'm just too tall. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Uh, I'm not a rock star, and I'm just too tall. Uh, Mr. Mayor and, and Council Members, thank you for uh, allowing me the opportunity to present what we've done over the last year or last several months to uh, do a report for your fire department. Um, my name is Clay Stewart, as the Chief said. Uh, I am not the only person on this team that, that, you, uh, that you hired. We actually have a fairly significant, uh, sizable team that came and did s different pieces of your, uh, of your report. Kurt Latipow is actually the project manager um, on record. Unfortunately, he had some medical issues and he had to bow out. And I, that's why I'm here. So uh, Randy Parr, who's a CPA, he did our finance pieces. Frank Black Blackley and Brian Kelly, they did the community risk assessment. Ken Kenma, he did our communications. Rich Buchanan uh, is, is active in EMS, and uh, he did our EMS and, and training. Eric Schmidt has his own GIS company, and he did our mapping and, and some of our uh, GIS component. And John Stouffer did some of the project's support. You may have met with uh, Don Trapp, who came out to do the on-site with everybody, uh, and we'll talk about that here in a moment. Um, overall, there's over 300 years of experience uh, on this team. We're all a bunch of uh, retired fire chiefs for the most part, and uh, uh, we love doing this stuff, and so thank you for allowing us to do that for you. Uh, we also want to thank the Santee team, all of the city staff who helped provide data, the fire chief, uh, the retired fire chief, John Garlow, the battalion chiefs, and all of the staff, uh, fire marshals, and the rest of the staff. Uh, I'm going to go as quick as possible. I think 246 pages may just, I, I could read it all if you'd like, but okay, all right, that's fine. So we'll just go with that. So the purpose of this was to do a community risk assessment, which is a it's a standardized document within the fire service, which is uh, to look at the community itself, the community overview, and the things that are specific to your community that you're facing as risks, fires, uh, EMS, that kind of stuff. The things that your fire department is typically uh, charged with um, uh, responding to. Our process started back in, uh, well, well before this. We had a kickoff meeting at the end of July and your staff had everything loaded to us in uh, September. We did an on-site survey in October. I tried to get out here and ended up not having, not being able to. I, I had I had COVID, so I couldn't travel. Uh, our our contract d delivery date would would be uh, March 18th. Hopefully, we made that happen for you. Since it's only the 22nd, I think we I feel pretty good. Um, then we took all your data, we supplemented it with national data, national information, state data, that kind of information, did a bunch of analysis. It's a deep dive into the, uh, into the data that you provided, uh, including the incident data, CAD data, and all of that, and tried to come up with something to give you an idea of what your community faces. Uh, really quickly, it starts off on the community risk side. We look at your population, your community makeup, population size, uh, at-risk uh, demographics, housing, land use, that sort of information. Uh, we look at all of the different hazards that are out there that we can identify. Uh, I was, I was uh, very interested in your dam inundation map. That was uh, pretty, pretty significant. Uh, a lot of uh, sublim... Uh, Sorry, um, 
the seismic hazards that you face, and some minor WUI hazards. Um, one of the things we do is called a three-axis scoring for all of your risk. And we take a uh, we take a, a mathematic formula that was developed by the Center of per, uh, Public Safety Excellence and run all of the numbers that we have through that. And what I like to do is compare them. And you can see on this one, I, I take out all the maximum risks because those are you're going to need help anyway. But your moderate risks, your high risk, and your low risks are the ones that you're probably dealing with day to day. One of the highest impact and probability uh, risks that you face is a moderate risk structure fire, which would be something like a single family residential structure. Then we looked at your current conditions. <clears throat> um, really, you have a very, very similar uh, makeup as most city fire departments. Right now, your current uh, support for the Santee Fire Department is about 10 million. We project that to be if there's no changes in, in your funding, that will go up to about 14 million in your 27 uh, and 28 budget. And we also noticed that there was a significant overtime expenditure that you guys were dealing with. So uh, it came up, we came up with a recommendation that if you hired two firefighters per shift, one at each station, that could help mitigate a lot of that overtime cost. Uh, then we looked at your management components. That's, that's your planning and your strategies and all of that kind of information. Uh, and you don't really have a department strategic plan, so we recommend you do some kind of a strategic planning process, update your mission, visions, and values. Uh, staffing. <clears throat> um, staffing models in the fire service are, are difficult, difficult to come by. Uh, one of the staffing models that we use more often than not is the NFPA uh, Fire Department Staffing Summary, where they look at not only the nation, but the regions, the different regions. You're in the western region. And their normalization statistic is to take it by population, uh, firefighters per 1,000 population. You're significantly lower than the region and very much lower than the uh, nation. And if you were in New York, you'd be really, really low, but you don't really worry about that. So this is a good guide for city planners and city managers to look at. If you can look at that number and try to keep your firefighters to that level, um, you're more likely to, to maintain an even keel and an even number uh, so that you don't have huge fluctuations and you know, heavy hits because you're way, way behind the curve and you don't have uh, overstaffing because uh, your, your population has changed. So our recommendation is to look at this uh, and use that as a guide uh, to go with. Right now, your operational staff is 54. If you use the uh, 1.05, uh, that would be 63 firefighters. And if you use the 1.29, that'd be 77. That's a lot. I know that. We looked at your stations and facilities. Um, and I don't think I'm going to tell you anything you don't already know. Uh, station 4 is in rough shape, uh, and the maintenance facility is really very inadequate. I will say it's very rare for us to say it needs replacement. That's not something we like to jump on and say, but both of these need to be addressed. Um, the, the Station 4 is really old. It doesn't fulfill the modern firefighting requirements, and the maintenance is pretty much just a shed. There were several uh, safety violations, not violations, but safety concerns that, are, that Don had when he came out. Station 5 is a great station. Unfortunately, you have a, a more people in it than it was designed for, which means that it's not going to last quite as long. So just something to be aware of. So that gave us two more recommendations. Uh, refurbish, replace, or move Station 4. Um, and then figure out what that's going to be for the best for your community. Um, and then begin working with, the, uh, with all of you to figure out the best location and the way to split the fleet out into a facility that's useful for them. And, and the recommendation does say split it out. Uh, there is the big equipment like your fire trucks, and then there's the cars. You can do it in one facility. You can do all that. That's fine. We find most cities have like a car service, like the police cars and the city trucks and all of that stuff in a smaller building. It's easier to deal with. 
and then you have to build a little bit bigger building for a fire truck. We've also seen them combined. So it's, it's either way is uh, completely acceptable. Uh, we looked at your apparatus. <clears throat> the recommendation I, recommendation I have here is to replace both engine 5 and 205. Um, not as much for 5 and 205 as it is for your reserves. Your reserves are in very poor status, which means that any time one of your trucks goes down, the likelihood that a reserve truck is available is actually decreased. So um, trucks break, and we have to be ready to, to deal with that. Uh, your 20-some-odd-year-old uh, fire truck and your 18-year-old fire truck are both definitely well past their usable life. Uh, ambulances are great. Uh, all your fleet vehicles are uh, in good, good shape. Uh, the study itself, I don't think you're going to find anything super spectacularly impressive about that. So over 77% of the calls in the city are actually uh, EMS calls. Surprise. Um, what kind of uh, threw me initially, I was doing the data uh, analysis piece of this, is the high number of what I would have considered mutual aid calls. I didn't take into account the, uh, the JPA area. So your JPA area is about 24, 25% of the calls that you run. You're running ambulances into that area. They're probably providing ambulances into your area as well. Um, and then 10%, which is pretty common for well-organized, well-staffed fire departments offering aid to the surrounding areas. So um, overall, very similar to most, most fire departments across the country. Your call concentration, <clears throat> excuse me. The majority of the call concentration is driven, of course, by EMS. So EMS and the overall con call concentration is in the same place, and that's over by Station 4, kind of moving to the uh, west. Fire concentration, though, moves more towards Station 5 and kind of centers around that. And you do have a significant uh, uh, fire danger within your, uh, within your city. A uh, few other things. Uh, your EMS volume, this one was interesting to me. Your EMS volume is uh, uh, overall 72%. That includes your mutual aids. Um, but 83% of the time of your responses are actually spent on EMS calls. So you're spending longer on EMS calls. That's usually not the case with other fire departments. So we dug deeper on that. Uh, your travel times are high from the scene to the hospital. Uh, right around 20 minutes was the uh, 90th percentile. And then, uh, s surprise, I know I heard from a few of you, the wait times are uh, s staggering to me. Outrageous. Outrageous. I think outrageous is a, is a good, good terminology. I'm from Colorado. Uh, something like this would definitely uh, be a call to arms. So this wait time issue needs to be addressed. I, would, I don't know how to address it. We've, I've talked to as many people as I know. Uh, hospitals tend to respond best to financial pressures. That's, that's the only thing I can tell you. There are a few communities that have actually gotten that down from hours to minutes, um, and usually it's, it's legal action or, or financial, uh, financial issues there. Clay, just yes. to let you know, the yeah. state of California is working on legislation now to require, I think it's a 10 or 20-minute turnaround for to get EMS out, so that could help us in the future. I, I, I really hope so, because this, is, this, is, uh, this isn't good. Um, I, I do know your LIMSA, the county LIMSA, has something similar. The uh, patient offload time goal is 20 minutes. Uh, I did see some that were five hours. So so. For, the, for the audience, can you describe what you're referring to? Sure. So uh, wait time is the time from when the ambulance gets to the hospital until they discharge their patient at the hospital. So they'll get to the hospital, uh, and they have to wait there until the hospital actually accepts the patient to leave. So they'll wait in the hospital, in the waiting room, or in the ER with the patient until the hospital says, yes, we'll take them. And for the record, what is our wait time on average? Your wait time, uh, we use the 90th percentile. It is right at, oh, gosh darn it, I, I didn't write it down, but it's right at an hour. Um, so three times the, the standard. Correct. Yes. 
Does this include Las Colinas or the, these factors? I know that's a hospital, but I also discovered when we had our workshop that there's a... Every, every hospital that you uh, transport to is included. And the, each one of these lines, if you look at the uh, actual... I think uh, I'm talking about something else. Oh, Maybe. okay. So yeah, no, Las, is... Las Colinas is the women's attention facility. Oh. Um, and so we do have a significant call volume there, but that's not the same as our hospital wait times. A little bit different. But can you explain what the issue is there at Las Colinas? Because it was new information for me. Yeah, the issue is the, the burden that having this county facility is putting on our local resources. So not to get too much on a tangent, but what happens is on a regular basis, people are brought to that facility they refuse to take them for a medical reason, they're released, and then they call our ambulances, and they basically then take them to the hospital. It's a, it's a pretty atrocious abuse of our services, and it's been going on for years. We're there almost on a daily basis, um, but it's a complex problem just like some of these other ones. So on, on the hospital wait time, I, I think I might have mentioned that, sorry. Paul. Um, <laughs> This has been a subject with, with me since my wife got on the Grossmont Health Care Board and I threatened to sue her. Um, but the, the reality is, is Grossmont, um, Grossmont Hospital, have we broken them down? Because I know that uh, last couple, about a week and a half ago, I went to Memorial because everybody always says Memorial is better, and there's 10 or 12 ambulances in their so called ambulance alley, whereas Grossmont's. Oh, you know, they had to make an ambulance alley for Grossmont. Uh, the charts that are actually in the report list out each one of the hospitals. Okay. Uh, this is uh, just doesn't have those hospitals by name, but it's that same chart. It just has the I don't I don't know which right, hospital. We're getting off tangent name. anyway, yeah. but the reality is, but it's in there. Hospital yes, wait sir. times are ridiculous, and and, yes. and it's not just that; it's Kaiser too. From it's, what I understand. It's the entire system and it's the entire state. So uh, what you were saying about the state actually trying to make a law or, or doing something proactive about this, that's going to be probably your best bet. Um, it's, it's, it's a big deal. You're pretty much supplementing hospital uh, staff with your staff. So. For free. For free. Free, to them. free to them. Yeah, I was going to say, well, yeah, <laughs> to them. That's right. They don't, they don't pay you to do that. That's why oftentimes that financial... Uh, pressure changes their mind because it's no longer free. Um, so any other questions on that one? I, I can tell that's a sore spot. And it's a store, sore spot across the state, I can tell you that. Uh, we've, we've done many, many studies here in California, and our, our, my jaw drops every time I do it. It's, it's crazy. But um, Unit hour utilization is what we look at for the incident for the unit. So in this case, uh, Medic 4 is on an incident uh, 40% or 39% of the time, 37.8% of the time over the five years in the study. Uh, Medic 5, 27.3, and, and we'll go through what that means and, and how that's affecting you. So that means that a third of their time, each of those units is actually on a call. But we're also not collecting all the data that we need to make sure how long they're committed to that call. We do collect the wait time because we know when they get to the hospital and we know when they clear the hospital. But we're really not capturing travel times. If you add back in how long it took them to travel to the hospital, back into the response, back into your area, since you don't have a hospital super close, um, their UHUs for the, uh, for the years is closer to 47 and 36. It's... it's um, that's a pretty significant number. For us, anything over 30% is a cautionary number, um, and you guys are definitely much higher than that. So their being, uh, their use is actually preclu precluding them from being ready for the next call, is, is what it comes down to. Um, so we have an, uh, the uh, average unit utilization of 47 and 36. Uh, Engine four is also extremely high. Uh, for fire, fire engines, the primary fire engine at a station, anything more than 10% is a, a cautionary term. 
Uh, ambulances have a higher UHU that's okay because they're not necessarily the first due and they're not the most flexible. They're not necessarily going to have to be there for a fire. They're there for a medical call. Um, although your ambulances also re respond to medical or uh, fires as well. But 12.7, that's pretty high. Engine 5 and engine 205 are both okay. They're under 10. If one of those were to move, then obviously those two would have to be grouped together, and you'd probably be looking at well over 10% for whichever one, uh, if that was just removed. Uh, the truck is in good shape. The trucks we like to see low for several reasons. Number one is it's expensive to drive. It's expensive to replace, as, as you all know, because you had to do it recently. Um, and you need to keep it for its specialty purposes when you can. Uh, there's no replacement for a truck when you need a truck. Um, I added this piece in on, this, on the, uh, on the uh, PowerPoint just to kind of give you an idea of what a day looks like. We try to give our firefighters some rest. It's a 24 hour, in your case, 48 hour shift. Uh, on that 24 hour period, we need to give them some time down so that they're uh, ready to go on the calls. Uh, anything under six hours, you're starting to really push them into that uh, over overload and not, not being able to function as well. Meals, we pay for meals because they have to be on duty. So uh, we try to give them a couple hours for that. Just those two things alone is about a third of their day. <clears throat> they have to check their vehicles and their equipment. That's an hour. Uh, paperwork and reports, a couple hours. Training, the standard here is two hours a day. Um, one hour for physical fitness is also your standard. And then the station maintenance, the cleanups, and keeping the station up and running. That's another two hours. So just your scheduled work is almost two-thirds of their day. Um, so when you look at Medic 4 and 5, on average, they're already busting that. So that means that on a busy, busy day, something's not happening. They're either not getting rested, they're not working out, they're not doing the trainings, something's happening, something has to give. They have to go on the calls. So just something to be aware of. Uh, just like most fire, fire departments, emergency services in the nation, most of your calls happen during the day when people are awake. Go figure, a little weird. 70% of all your calls is, are between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. Uh, oh, so our recommendation is to consider adding a peak ALS unit. Um, it came to my attention tonight that you might be doing it as a BLS unit. That serves the same purpose. Try to get some of the pressure off of those ambulances. Um, call processing, your dispatch center is doing great. I don't... It's, it's going to be hard for them to get any faster than a minute 20, a minute for a, uh, a priority call at the 90th percentile. That's the standard, um, and they're really close to that. This is, these are, that's a great number. Uh, turnout times uh, right at the two-minute mark, anywhere from 60, 60 seconds to, uh, to, to, to 120 seconds is really what you're seeing as a pretty decent turnout time. Uh, the NFPA standard is 64 a, 60 seconds for an EMS call and 80 seconds for a fire call where they have to put all their gear on. But uh, I can tell you that's uh, not what we see nationally. That's a very difficult number to get to. That, that could be the goal. Uh, travel times, where your stations are located, that pretty much uh, drives this number. Uh, you, and I apologize about the Battalion 4, Battalion 5. That's how it came across in the data that we got, and that's from your CAD. Um, I know you don't have two battalions. It roughly approximates Station 4 and Station 5. It's, it's pretty darn close to that, uh, but I didn't have actual drawn boundaries, so I can't say it was Station 4 or Station 5. Um, overall, six-minute six drive time to an incident at the 90th percentile. Uh, NFPA recommends four minutes. That's a tough number to get to. So what one of our recommendations is for you guys to develop a standard. This is what we want you to be able to provide. Um, travel distance. The ISO does it by miles. We're going to do another one that's uh, uh, NFPA. They do it by minutes. And this is a modeled uh, system from our GIS person. Engine should be with one, within one and a half miles of your uh, station f to get full credit, and you have several areas in your in your city that aren't within the one and a half miles. 
Um, they also have a five mile. It has to be within five miles to be even rated. Everything within your city is within the five miles. So every building in the city is actually rated on the ISO charts. And then the specialty equipment, in this case your truck, uh, is within two miles. And you can see there's a, a significant portion of your city off to the west that does not have that two-mile uh, two coverage. This one, for me, as an as a, uh, old fire guy, this one's the time is what we're after. We're, we're much more interested in time than distance. Um, in this case, the uh, four minutes is that NFPA standard. Eight minutes is, a, is another standard for an S NFPA. That's the full effective re response force. It also used to be when they said an ambulance should show up. Um, so we do that four to eight minute. You can kind of see where you're, where you're having trouble getting to. Um, obviously on all of the unimproved areas, but then uh, for that four minute to five, six minute in the west, in the north, and in the uh, east are all, you're having difficulty get in, getting into those areas. And that is really a, a function of where the fire stations are located. <clears throat> uh, the chief gave me your district boundaries. Uh, for each one of the council members just to show you where your specific districts are for travel time at the 90th percentile. On emergent calls, District 4 is at 511. District 1 is at uh, 653, so almost seven minutes for District 1. District 3 is uh, right at the six-minute mark, and District 2 is uh, 542. So that's... Uh, Can you explain the, uh, the thousand figures there? Also? That's the number of calls that were emergent responses that counted for these numbers. If they're not emergent, we don't really count them for time because that means they're going with traffic, they don't have their lights and sirens on. Uh, and then the, each one of the dots in, on the map next to it, that just indicates anything over eight minutes is a red dot, anything under eight minutes is a green dot. And the darker the green, the faster the response. <laughs> Uh, multiple units, a lot of your incidents require multiple units. As a matter of fact, most of your incidents require multiple units. Uh, you can get the first unit travel time within 612, second unit 725, and then it starts to go up from there, the third unit. And this is the number of times uh, those, uh, those were met. Um, so uh, exponentially higher. And when we get to this one, the effective response force... Now, this is total time. From the time somebody picks up the phone and, and uh, your dispatcher answers until you get that first unit on scene for a structure fire is about 7 minutes, 33 seconds. It's a long time if you're on the phone. For the full effective response force to get on scene of a structure fire, that's uh, 90th percentile is 1048. Medical calls is 727, 855. The major difference there, the effective response force for a medical call is an engine and a medic, an ambulance. So, uh, concurrency, you run two calls often. A uh, third of the time when one call is happening, another call is not going at the same time. It's pretty common for you to go down to three calls. That's about 15% of the time that'll happen. And then uh, anything past three calls, it's not really common, but it does happen, up to seven calls. You have... Uh, six units that can respond within your area, two, three engines, a truck, and, and two ambulances. So anything past six would be a, a point of concern. That's when you're having to call in mutual aid and do all that stuff. Uh, you don't really meet that very often. Uh, multiple units assigned, you know, almost half the time you're sending at least two units. That makes sense. 77% of the calls are EMS and you have an engine and ambulance. Uh, population growth and service projections. <clears throat> I really could become a millionaire if I could figure out what correlates to service demand projections. We used to think it was all population growth. Your population isn't going to grow significantly. It's going to grow some, but not a lot. But your call volume is projected to actually double uh, from 2011 to 20. 31. So in 20 years, you're going to go from 4,500 calls to 8,366 calls projected. And that's just a straight line projection. Part of it, we believe, is the age of your population. 
Don't know if it's actually a real causal or a corollary, corollary effect. It, I just I don't have a good um, good number for you, but we do we do see a trend when the population ages that the calls for service ages uh, 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 go up as well. So these are our uh, these are our projections for you. Hold on. So go, yeah. can you go back to that? Yeah. So you say you don't really know what that is. So how do you how are you coming? This up with is just a linear that? regression back to the uh, 2011. Uh, uh, so you took 2011 through. We, we went to 2041, years. so yeah, and just it's just an average, a, and then just average that up straight. Uh, it's I'll I'll use one of four models to do it. This one was just a pretty much a straight linear regression back through the years. So we go from 2021, which was actual data, down to 2011, and then we find out what that slope is, and then project that out, and then we try to put a confidence band to that. So um, somewhere in 2041, probably around 10,000 calls. That's a best guess. I can I can tell you right now. Uh, this one's pretty narrow because you had a very steep slope and a very well defined slope. Some of them get pretty wide. Um, so anywhere from uh, nine thousand five hundred ish to uh, eleven thousand is is what we're projecting in twenty forty one. Okay. Twenty twenty two. I can be pretty confident that your numbers in 2022 were, uh, what, 6,000, almost 7,000 calls. Is that right, Chief? Or do you have that in front of you? It, it's okay. I didn't want to put you on the spot. My apologies. So one year. You don't have that? What? <laughs> one year, I'm really confident. Up to five years, I feel pretty good about it. Up to 20 years, I think. <laughs> so, I mean, we're talking projections rates. here. I mean, it's, it's tough. It's tough to figure that one out. Um, and then we looked at all your different programs, the communication system, your EMS system, life safety, training, and special operations. The only one I want to bring, uh, bring to the fore is the training. And a lot of this comes down to the training hours are not very smooth uh, across the board. We don't have, uh, I think the standard was uh, 420 hours. And that's, that's not, is that, was that right? Or did I? 240. 240, yeah, 420, 240, uh, whatever it takes. Uh, so 240 hours, everybody should be at that line or above. And you can see that it's kind of all over the board right now. So because of that, we're recommending two things. Uh, figure out a good, specific annual training requirement and program. Put it in place. That's just staff time. That's probably not going to cost uh, the city any extra money. But somebody needs to manage that. So we're recommending adding right, wait, some kind of a training I, officer. Is there an average here, though? I mean, I see this thing going up and down, too. But is there an average across the board between all the firefighters, That how many hours of training they have? Because it looks like we have some real overachievers and some underachievers. Yes, correct. Absolutely. You have some folks that are just on it. And uh, right. part of that could be they're newer. When they're newer, they have to do more. I agree. Um, yeah, it's, it's, and it's, some of them are just, you know, stars. <laughs> Some of them may not be capturing their times. I don't, I, I don't recall if there's an average in the report. I apologize. Yes. So we don't have names associated with this that we can? No. I I, no. Yeah. Would you like it? <laughs> we, did not, we did not get names for any of that stuff. So. Number 53 has got some work to do. <laughs> um, we have some other recommendations. These are just the, uh, the low-hanging fruit type. Um, increase your urban wildland interface uh, time and all of these are in your in your document. If you'd like, I can go through each one of them, but these aren't going to be the the big ticket items. So, with that, I'll call for questions. Any clarification or questions? Let's do uh, speakers' lips first. I have six speakers. The first speaker is Truth. Uh, first, I have to say that eco extortionists, I'm going to steal that line, Laura. I will give you credit. Uh, what I learned, though, is that the butterflies, they're going to be connected. We don't know how. They're just going to be connected. And Rob Hawks, which are in Santee, have also been affected. So have bats. So this item's attachment, community risk assessment, long-range master plan, is a 229-page book. 
and it comes with a ridiculous amount of 26 recommendations. A nice admission in that book is, quote, Sandag wants 1,219 housing units for Santee by 2029 and nearly 900 units upsizing zoning to increased density. With multifamily housing, the risk of cooking fires is twice the rate of other building fires. With buildings three or more stories in height, a ladder truck may be necessary since most ground ladders cannot reach these heights, end quote. From the February 26th meeting, we heard how the Santee firefighters can barely keep up with all the calls coming into Lantern Crest alone, uh, which these council members just approved the expansion of. And so that's going to exacerbate the problem. So add on more stack and packs and the people of the city of Santee are really going to be feeling the heat soon. Uh, a fun fact in this item is, quote, sdg e provides electrical service for Santee. Recent terrorist attacks on electrical substations have affected communities with a loss of power for several days. SDG&E may implement public safety power shutoffs after utilizing a system to determine if conditions are forecasted to deteriorate, end quote. So how does a computer system forecast perfectly implemented expert attacks on substations? We need to find that out. But in January alone, in one month, El Cajon, Balboa Park, Bonita, Carlsbad, Coronado, Encinitas, Fallbrook, La Mesa, Mission Beach, Lincoln Park, Logan Heights, Mountain View, Lemon Grove, Encanto, Emerald Hills, Valencia Park, Paradise Hills, Skyline, Bay Terraces, Oceanside, and Ramona were all without electricity because of sdg &E's failures, their attacks on us. So everyone, be sure to give them a piece of your mind about their increased rates tomorrow at the S uh, CPUC Forum in Sherman Heights. Now, as far as the budget, uh, here's some chunks of change. We've got the city manager who gets a super inflated $1.2 million. The city attorney gets over $747,000. And the city clerk gets over $545,000. And how about the IT? They get over $544,000 and yet can't even upload these meetings to YouTube. I don't know. I think maybe they should get a pay cut. They're not going to do that. So I'm going to say there's no way... Any of you council members read this 229-page attachment before voting on it? Come on. But I, I do really hope that uh, you guys are going to work on those wait times because that's a scary thought for anybody that really needs help. So thanks. Look into that. Next speaker I have is Dustin Gerhardt. Mr. Mayor, before I begin, um, we have four additional speakers that would like to speak, and I would like to try to uh, merge them all together, and they're allotting time for me to speak. Uh, I promise you it won't be longer than 15 minutes. Okay, generally we'll do that where you can get um, several speakers. Only one person gets to speak, though, for the 15 minutes, so you want to take that time. Yeah, just me, sir. Yeah. Okay, I just want to make that clear. Okay. All right, we'll do that. Okay, give us a second. Thank you. Go ahead. All right. Well, good evening. My name is Dustin Gerhardt. I'm the president of the Santee Firefighters Association. And uh, before I begin, I just want to say thank you to all the staff who help uh, contribute to this report. Um, I know that it's a, a lot of work, a lot of data, a lot of information to kind of pack into one report that took over a year to put together. So just want to say thank you for that. Um, after, re after, re after reviewing the, re the uh, report, I got to say um, there really wasn't that many things that, that surprised us. The report states that we are short firefighters. Ambulances are exceeding their UHU. We have issues with response times. Not enough stations, not enough equipment. And the station force condition was categorized as poor. We knew it was going to say all, all of these things because we live it every day. And our union has been trying to address this for years with little to no progress. The increased call volume with no additional fire and EMS services has pushed our personnel to the brink, to the point where many of our firefighters are considering working for other agencies. This is not what our taxpaying citizens should receive for their medical services. We acknowledge that there are many factors that impact these response times that we've already discussed today. With the formation of the Santee Lakes at Emergency Medical Services Authority, we know that we will start to see some positive impacts to our community and our personnel. But we saw the issue of coverage gaps in the north end of the city that were identified in the 2010 CityGate report. And we have been pushing to address these coverage issues for over 10 years. And again, there's no plan. 
This report also identified a coverage gap in the southwest portion of our city. We have outgrown being a two-station department. Eight-minute response times from our current fire stations are unacceptable. It's very clear to us that we need to make changes by adding more fire stations. Council Member Trotter, I wanted to take a moment to say thank you for addressing some of these issues. You have been doing ride-alongs with our medic units and our fire engines to see, some of the, to see firsthand some of the issues that we're dealing with. And you, and you have started taking immediate action. We appreciate your desire to make public safety a priority. So thank you. Vice Mayor Koval. Thank you for your dedication with making our emergency medical services a priority. As the commissioning chair for SLMSA, you have already enacted the process of enhancing our EMS delivery model, and you have been a, a supporter from day one with trying to create a positive change for your district and our community. So again, thank you. Mayor Mento, you have dedicated your entire life to public safety. You know the challenges that we are facing today. We need your support with addressing these serious public safety concerns. And I'm confident with your help, we can make tangible changes to the fire department. And I know that there's a lot to digest in this report. And we need to acknowledge that there are plenty of needs that other departments within our city have as well. But how are we going to pay for all this? We're talking tens of millions of dollars. It's very clear to us that we need a tax measure to pay for these items that, that have been neglected for far too long. We will continue to advocate for our community, and we want to work with our city leaders to address these important issues. When someone in our community picks up the phone to call 911, they are depending on us to provide a service that they expect from their fire department. Our firefighters are now relying on you. It's up to you to help expand the, our fire and emergency medical services to meet the standards our community deserves. So thank you. Thank you. Is that it? Well, I thought he was speaking for all of them. Well, I just didn't know if there was Does anybody else, else want to speak in the fire union? Okay. No, we'll go ahead and no. go to council comments and questions. Um, let, me, let me start out. And, um, uh, you know, thank you very much for your comments regarding me because you're right. I've been knowing this a long time. Um, one thing that has always bothered me is year after year, in some cases, decade after decade, uh, we always hear the term, uh, we're going to do more with less. And I really hate that term. Um, there was a chief of police once was talking to his troops and talked about how great it was we were doing more with less. And he actually said more and more with less. And he said, the great part about this is pretty soon we're going to do everything with nothing at all. And you know what? That's not a sustainable way to go. Um, I did read this report. Um, I was not shocked by anything in it. And just like the firefighters, and I, I know there's an awful lot of year tonight. I want to make sure you understand I appreciate everything you do every single day. I know you're in harm's way. I know some of you have been hurt over the years. But, you know, you just keep playing hurt. And that's what we do when we go into public safety. So thank you. What I would like to do is see um, Heather <laughs> and city manager, fire department, start finding a way to increase the number of firefighters we do have in our city. Because, you know, we talk about EIRs, and, you know, an EIR is not just about the environment like bugs and bunnies. It's also about the services that we can provide. For instance, if you get one building that has six, uh, you know, apartments in it, uh, do you need more police officers or do you just have one go around the building at the same time? Well, that can maybe work, but if it's six apartments in one same piece of property, now you might have to have more than a couple of firefighters to go there, where in the past if it's one-story dwelling, eh, perhaps they could get away with a truck and uh, an engine. Uh, not so much if you build up. Uh, so we probably need to have some more firefighters. Uh, today when I was uh, talking with the chief, I asked uh, about that 90 percent and um, or 93 or whatever that number was. And I said, so how does that actually work? Because if you uh, add one firefighter 
Okay, maybe that could bring you up to that percentage uh, per thousand. Uh, but how does that change everything else? Because it leaves an uneven number to work in the field. So you have to go at least by twos, but it doesn't really create a sense of um, well-being if you got two fire stations. Well, they both need to be staffed the same way at least. So now you're talking at least four more firefighters. How we do that? I don't know. Maybe a tax initiative is the best way of doing that. I think I probably would support that. Uh, I don't like taxes, but if I'm going to get more firefighters and I can see the work they're doing and um, I can get the equipment to provide it for them, I think that's what I would like to do. And uh, nobody likes to see it, but, you know, eventually you're going to, you know, state keeps taking our money. They make us the bad guy by saying, go raise your taxes. Well, they don't raise taxes because they don't want to be the bad guy. Um, but you know what? When it comes to firefighters and our service, you know what? You're not being the bad guy. You're being the, the person that uh, provides a good service. Um, I like a lot of the recommendations. I like the training idea. I uh, would support having a... Uh, a uh, I don't even, administrative chief of some kind, I don't know, it wouldn't be a battalion chief probably, but a training chief. Yeah, there we go, call him a training chief. And he makes sure that everybody gets everything they need. Um, but uh, I think it's going to be a long road to hoe, but I think we need to get it. Um, we need to quit talking about how great we do with nothing at all. Okay, comments? Uh, it, on that training chief, could we use Heartlands? Somebody at Heartland to do it? or I don't think so. Um, that's a, a whole different... Yeah, uh, yeah, I know, but I didn't know if we could do some training. We yeah. do some training over there. Well, they use a facility, but that's about it, I think. I had the question for the chief. No, that model wouldn't really be viable. Great, thanks. Do you have questions? So I was able to meet with the chief and and city manager and actually council member, sorry, vice mayor, vice mayor Koval, um, and get my questions answered okay. prior to this. So, All right. And I, I just want to comment um, that you know we did review everything in the and um, very thorough review. So thank you for that. And we are as a council dedicated to working on that list. I think you know we have you know we have been we, we don't talk about it every council meeting. Um, but we did need to see this report because we needed the data to make sure that the next step uh, makes sense. You know, it, we, we all had our assumptions. Yeah. We really did. I mean, I live in District 3, so I, I, know, <laughs> I, I know what's happening in my hood. But um, we're, all, we're all data driven. We need to, to see that. But that, that doesn't mean we haven't been working on things for the last several years on the list. So. And I just want to make that comment. Uh, yeah, and the next item goes towards exactly that. That a number of these things are already being addressed that were in the report. Um, they were already in the works. It's just a matter of finalizing the steps necessary to get them going. But it does. I mean, it, it does absolutely put a, a spotlight on, um, especially Station Four that we've been talking about for years and how we're going to do this. And uh, I do appreciate that the city manager had some good ideas with spreading where to spread these things, the stations out. Uh, so it could maybe be a little bit more affordable for the city of Santee and the taxpayers in the city of Santee. Uh, and at the same time, provide better, uh, better coverage and better care for our citizens. So these are, I mean, they're, they're real, real solutions, not just pie in the sky things. And um, I want to, obviously, we're going to continue to, <laughs> push for this in our um, our capital improvement funding uh, in, into the future. These are just, these are the things that have to be in the for, for, uh, first and foremost. We discussed that at our retreat as well, this being one of the highest priorities, especially New Station 4. So now we're, now we're there. Now we have the data to, to support and we are, we're there. I think the council's all there. Right. Dustin? Yeah, I don't have a lot of feedback on the report because we, I have spent a tremendous amount of time in the last two, three weeks <laughs> looking at this report and looking at a lot of other data and information and stuff. I just want to 
obviously same reiterate what I've said before in the last four months and beyond is okay, now what are we gonna do about a plan? What's what's the next steps? You know, is it getting everybody together in a room? Is it fire chief taking the lead on this thing? How, how, where are we going here? So that's yes. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wait for a plan. But, you know, I could put the city manager on the spot here and say, what's the next step? Mr. Mayor, thank you. Uh, we really do appreciate the data that's in the report. The next step is for the chief and I and critical players to get together and look at how we bring back some responses to what we heard in the report tonight. The plan is to bring that back at your second council meeting in April to have some concepts get city council direction from that meeting. And then as to the larger infrastructure issues, not so much the operational issues within the department, but related to the infrastructure issues, we will propose how we're going to handle that based upon council direction in the CIP budget that will come back before the city council the last week of March, uh, pardon me, of May. So it's a, it's a standard process. We hear the information. We come back with some ideas. You tell us what you like. We come back with the CIP budget that has some ideas about how we're going to fund that and what the timing is to be able to make that move forward. Operationally, I know the chief's already looking at some of the other um, issues that are moving forward in training and other kinds of things. That will be included in next year's operational budget. And we are in, starting tomorrow, we're in discussions with the association about how to handle some of the other recommendations. So I would imagine you'll see several things checked off of this list within the next couple of months. Thanks. I, I probably don't have to say this, but uh, sooner is better on everything. So on everything. On everything. <laughs> I know, well, it's a broad brush, but I, de I decided to use it. So any, anything else? Okay, great. Thank you very much for the uh, report. Thank, thank you, and thank you for reading it. You just made my evening go a lot faster. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. All right, then. Let's go to item number 13, which is a resolution establishing the classification of a full-time and a part-time non-safety emergency medical technician, adopting a revised salary schedule, including the pay range for EMTs and authorization to hire four full-time EMTs and eight part-time EMTs. Chief. Mr. Mayor, honorable members of the council, um, I won't restate the resolution as uh, the mayor just read that. Um, I think an easier term to conceptualize what we're proposing here is the development of a EMT program for Santee. What some of you may not realize is that Santee and Lakeside were actually the first paramedics in the county of San Diego and provided the first ambulance service in the county of San Diego starting in June 16th of 1965, 1975, correction. In order for us to provide those services, we had to enter into an, a, a partnership, and I like to really highlight that term, partnership, with the County of San Diego in 1974 to assist us in levying taxes for those ambulance services. Keep in mind that the fire department used to be a fire protection district, which was established in 1965, um, correction, 1956, and this predated the, the incorporation of the city. So we needed this mechanism to collect funds. So we started the partnership in 1974 with the County of San Diego, and we have been accustomed to this term of the County Service Area 69, which served Santee Lakeside and in the unincorporated area of El Cajon, we refer to as Bostonia. The last ambulance that we put into service to increase our capacity was in 2005. And during that time in 2004, some of us in this room were assisting with gathering data and making projections of what our call volume would eventually be. So we fortunately got a, a new medic unit in service in 2005, and that was the last time we added any service to the CSA, again, those three entities. And at the time, we projected that by 2020, we would hit this kind of monumental call volume threshold of 10,000 calls. Well, we hit it in 2012, 
instead of 2020. And we kept seeing our numbers increase year after year after year. Now, again, the County of San Diego, in particular, a division of the County of San Diego, the Health and Human Services Division, which has now been folded into the County Fire Authority, they were really the decision makers that would allow us to increase funding to increase service. And so that was administered through the CX, CSA 69 Advisory Board. But again, the county was the ones that ultimately made the decision. We started making presentations in 2016 because we saw that our reserves were continuing to escalate, but our service level was not being increased. And so we started to demonstrate our, again, our increasing call volume and trying to demonstrate that we had a need for an additional unit. So I use this because 2017 was the first time we made a formal proposal. And this was the graph that we showed at a CSA 69 advisory board meeting. And at that time, we were hitting 13,300 calls. Our current call volume is 14,621. And as Clay already mentioned on behalf of AP Triton, 9,653, almost 10,000 transports for four medic units is, is insane. It's, it's, we have busy, busy units. And we've been saying this for almost seven years. We made our first proposal for an additional unit in 2017. That was denied. We made additional proposals for a BLS unit two times in February and April of 2018. That was denied both times. In 2019, the county commissioned a consulting firm, CPSM, to do an analysis of CSA 69 and 17. CSA 17 is kind of our sister group or a sister service area that's up in the North County. And they wanted to analyze the sustainability of our current CSA. The findings of that report worked in our favor. Now, this report was supposed to actually come out in 2020, but COVID hit and there were some other things that the county understandably had to do. Um, they were extremely involved in the COVID response. And so this kind of took a back burner for almost a year. But two of the major recommendations coming from this comprehensive report was the dissolution of CSA 69, the development of a transition plan, and then the creation of a JPA between Santee and Lakeside to take over local control. Essentially, they said, let's eliminate this unnecessary layer of government. Let's give control to our local agencies and let them manage it. They've been doing it for 40 years. They know what they're doing. Let's get rid of the counties, this extra layer. So that, the last projection that they provided for us was in 2022. And that projection was that we had reserves, again, continue to escalate, of $12,282,000 for 23-24. And in 2025-26, almost $16 million, $15.5 plus million dollars in reserves. So... Again, I go back to the numerous times we've asked for additional service levels, denied, 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 don't know about the sustainability. The private consulting firm comes in, they said, look, give it to low control. And also, by the way, you have a lot of money that you could add back into your system. Instead of just sitting in a bank account, you could actually start to service your communities appropriately. We developed a timeline and a transition plan. This was rolled out over a year ago. And... I am proud to say that we have hit each one of these benchmarks ahead of time, if not on time. Although formally created in August 10, 2022, the Santee Lakeside EMS Authority, we did not take over actual administrative and operational control until January 1st of 2023. We had been doing the same temporal analysis that AP Triton just put out, and I stole one of their graphs, showing that what we already knew, 70% or a significant number of our calls occurred between the hours of 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. We had done an analysis of where our call volume occurred. Now, the map you see on your left-hand side of it is the entire SLEMSA versus just the city of Santee, but we know that we know where the concentration of our calls are, and so this was reiterated by AP Triton's report. In September, October, November, December of last year, we did what we believe was the first of its kind 
analysis of what the true number of BLS level calls were. I use the term BLS synonymously with an EMT because BLS stands for basic life support. EMT is an emergency medical technician, which is a little bit lower, I shouldn't say a little, significantly lower level of training than our paramedics. So when we say BLS, we're curious how many calls could be handled by an EMT versus a paramedic. A paramedic, I use synonymously with the term advanced life support or ALS. Higher level of training, that's what all of our personnel are trained to. We found that a true representation of our BLS percentage was approximately 50%. This was done between Santee and Lakeside. Chief Bagley and Chief Jordan put this, this study together with the support of the County of San Diego. And we also had a nurse coordinator that collaborated with us to look at all of our call volume. So we have a very high level of confidence that a significant portion of our calls are BLS level. Our commission took pretty rapid action and made a couple changes to the way that we do our billing. And so quite a few things in here, but the point of this is showing that in a short period of time, we believe that we're going to see additional revenue. And now this is additional money on top of the already reserves that we showed you that we're going to see additional revenue of over $1.2 million a year going into our SLMSA account because of some changes in how we bill non-residents that are not paying the, the now JPA subsidy and also a mileage increase. And then the big ticket item is our voluntary participation in a national program called the Public, Pri Public Provider Ground Emergency Medical Transport Intergovernmental Transfer, the PPGMT IGT. It's a lot. It is a lot. Point being is our low end estimates of participation in this program is $500,000. Our high end is closer to $1.2 million. We're using a conservative estimate because I'm, I was born, I was raised on the, on the uh, Tim McDermott School of Financial Accounting and Reporting, under promise over deliver. Uh, we use the most conservative number um, that we could find is the 500000 So we feel confident that we're going to see a pretty significant amount of increase in revenue. On February 9th, the commission approved these system improvements, which was a 12-hour BLS unit for Lakeside, a 12-hour BLS unit for Santee, an EMS nurse coordinator, and a medical director. We have since hired a joint nurse coordinator for Santee and Lakeside. Uh, she started a couple days ago. We have since worked to secure a medical director that now we'll be hopefully having onboarded by May 1st. And this will be a collaboration with all the central zone agencies, other fire departments. Lakeside has already started their onboarding process to roll out their ambulance. And we are now presenting this to this body. Now, why we have to take these extra steps. The SLEMSA, the commission, really authorizes the expenditure of funds, but they don't hire any personnel. It's up to the two agencies, Santee and Lakeside, to hire any personnel. So they could authorize the funds, but our two governing bodies need to authorize actually hiring people and bringing on these positions into our city. So just wanted to explain kind of the nuance of how the commission works versus our city council. So our proposal to staff this 12-hour BLS unit is to hire full-time four personnel, hire part-time eight personnel for a total program cost of approximately $380,000. Now, $425,000 was approved by the commission. We're coming underneath this because we have since tightened up our numbers and we have a pretty good idea of working really close with finance of what our real costs will be. Um, we do anticipate, obviously, there'll be small escalators each year, but we're coming underneath the allocated amount from the commission. Our recommendation is adopt the resolution approving the following items and find that their action is not a project subject to CEQA, the establishment of a classification of EMT full-time and part-time employees, an amended salary schedule, including a salary range for full-time and part-time non-safety EMTs, and to increase the appropriation in the Emergency Medical Service Department by $380,000 to fund an increase with revenue generated from the Santee Lakeside Emergency Medical Service Authority. I think I might have misread that. But essentially, what is important, I think I showed a previous slide, is 
all funding for these positions will be coming from the Santee Lakeside EMS Authority with zero dollars coming from the general fund. That's the end of my report. Thanks, Chief. Let's go to uh, Speaker Slips. We have one speaker, Truth. All right. But John, more with less is, and even more with nothing is literally the definition of the word sustainable. So you might want to go against that. And Justin, the county did whatever they wanted to do in 2020, including telling firefighters that they had to get that COVID clot shot or lose their jobs. So this item continues some of the information from the last item 12. We're over $764,000 will be spent to pay for more firefighters, EMTs, paramedics, equipment, and more. And two hundred dollars to 300000 will be spent to buy another ambulance. That was all great to hear. The only thing that was concerning was the inconsistency of training requirements met amongst firefighters. You know that number 53, Ron? Um, this item says that this year, the county service area 69 was dissolved and taken over by Santee Lakeside Emergency Medical Services Authority. It was definitely a good decision to make that control local because nobody understands what the community requires for EMS safety better than the people who actually live in the areas affected. So now four full-time EMT staff are required at a cost of over $330,000. And eight part-time EMT staff are required at a cost of over $49,000. Makes a total of $380,000 toward the new basic life support, transport, ambulances that the Santee Lakeside Emergency Medical Services Authority Commission just approved. I'm curious, though, if you council members said no to that request, what would happen? In fighting with fire hoses? <laughs> but no, seriously, uh, go on and approve their request. It's great to finally see money going to where it should, which is people's safety, right? So more firefighters, more EM, uh, EMTs and paramedics, it's all good. I do recommend looking at the budget, since this didn't come from the general fund, right? So instead of taxes, you might want to make adjustments to the budget before you do the last resort of taxes. Other than that, sounds good. Thanks. Thanks. Um, Vice Mayor? Sure. So isn't it great what took the county seven years to never do took the new commissioners a couple months to, to do? And uh, that's why local control is what we fought so, fought, fought so hard for. Um, and I also do want to point out, if you looked at the budget, with the um, tweaks in the funding mechanisms, we're covering the cost of everything we're proposing. Well, I guess I'm taking off my SLEMSA hat. No. What, everything SLEMSA is proposing um, just by, by, by those fees right there. And um, so we're not dipping into our fund, our savings account to, to cover this, which means we still have that projected 13 to $15 million. Uh, motion to approve. Second. Thanks. Would... One quick question before I go. Um, does SLIMSA have the authority to, um, or the ability to be encumbered with uh, grants or bonds? Um, and because you talked about how the uh, revenue increase is going to go. And isn't that what would actually pay for a new ambulance or, you know, or something like that? Because I'd hate to have to come back to either agency and say, well, you have to foot the bill or you have to approve it, but we're going to foot the bill or something like that. Has that, any of that been worked out yet? When you said encumbered and grant and bond, I figured that's a Sean answer. <laughs> I mean, the, the agency is a JPA with full powers uh, consistent with the powers that um, the city and Lakeside uh, share in common. So, yes, they can accept grants um, and take other actions. I mean, the, the main purpose is what Justin articulated, which is get, a, get, a, get rid of CSA 69, get the money local, and get it to these kinds of actions. Um, but they do have that power because uh, it's a power that uh, the city and Lakeside share. Good, perfect, thanks. Rob, did you have something? Yeah, I just wanted, once again, just to say you know, thank you to, uh, to the captain and, and the previous captain, Captain Garlow, and uh, Vice and Mayor. Chief? I'm Chief, gosh, I said <laughs> Jimmy Christmas. Um, I'm looking at the captain sitting right next to you. <laughs> uh, the Chiefs, 
and uh, Vice Mayor Koval. Uh, I, I recall when CSA 69 was was screaming that it was losing money and uh, there was going to be a deficit of a couple million dollars and things still weren't being spent and everybody knew it was a it was a hoax and it was just really I mean I you'll think it was I think it was really a setup for a, a money grab from the county at some point but um, I really appreciate truly appreciate the hard work that you did to get this actually pushed through uh, finally to get uh, to make your voice be heard so that this could happen and uh, to get the right people paying attention so this could happen uh, I think this is something this truly could be one of the one of the best things that could happen could have happened in for the city of Santee in many many years and many years to come so thank you very much for your hard work thank you for your hard work this is really huge and I look forward to seeing more out of this. Thank you. All right, then. Anything else? If not, have a motion and a second. Please prepare to vote and lock in those votes. Motion carries unanimously. That takes us to our next round of non-agenda public comment. No speaker, sir. Thank you. City Council reports, Ron. Vice Mayor. Go Aztecs. <laughs> Go Aztecs. I know. Activated. <laughs> Dustin, anything? Yeah, I just want to know at the Mission Trails Regional Task Force meeting, um, talked to the task force and told them also we're going to start the road improvements on Mesa Road over there, but we've also developed a plan for the new trailhead um, at behind Big Rock Park at, at Mission Gorge there, uh, Mission, Mission Trails Regional Park, sorry, in there. And the city has already uh, requested uh, $1.7 million from the federal government and Congress to fund that project in its entirety. Wow. Um, so that, that's already been... Get it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, we'll find out if it gets approved, but we've already, already sent requests for it to have it fully approved. Um, I was able to secure a... Um, a with the letter... Um, of support from Kensington Campillo's office uh, for the city of San Diego because there is a JPA with San Diego, Santee, and the county, but we were denied a letter of support from the county <laughs> in the project. So we got a few other letters of support from local uh, chambers of commerce and other, uh, other agencies, but just want to let you know the county denied our uh, request for support for the project. So. Who did you ask? Nick? We asked the chamber, the school district, San Diego, ADC. Um, I think he's referring oh, for the, the county. county. Oh, the county. We asked uh, the, the parks director, and we, uh, we kindly got a decline letter regarding that. Parks director. Parks and, director. and Supervisor Anderson's office. Gotcha. All right. Thank you. All right. Uh, yeah. I uh, want to give uh, kudos to Community Services Department for Fido Fest. Uh, it was not what you wanted to have happen, but what a, what a great recovery that you guys did in bringing it into the parking lot literally last second, if not last minute, last second, um, so that it could still go on. Um, a lot of happy kids, a lot of happy dogs, uh, a lot of happy dog owners. You guys did a really, really good job with that. And like I said, I know it wasn't what you, the way you envisioned it, the way you wanted it, but great job of of coming together as a team and making it happen at the last second. Thank you, sir. All right. The only report I have is that uh, we did have a Sandag retreat on uh, a couple weeks ago. I, pardon me? You're all loving each other now? Yeah, I wouldn't say that. Um, I, I will say this, that it was a lot of good conversation. A lot of folks uh, agreed to uh, work better together. Um, of course, some of my comments were how optimistic I would be, but my pessimist self says, well, I'll believe it when I see it, and, um, and that's pretty much time will tell. Time will tell. And um, let's see, what else? Uh, I think that's it. City Manager. Okay, I have a couple of items tonight. I'll try to go quickly, ladies and gentlemen. First... I do want to give kudos to Lieutenant Ledoux, who's hiding back there where he always hides. This is his last city council meeting for the city of Santee. He is being transferred downtown. 
and we're going to miss him. Uh, I know we have a really good person coming in behind, but uh, thank you very much for your service to the city of Santee. David, going downtown is not an upgrade, I'm, tell- I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to thank you. Um, second, we mentioned before the meeting there was a little chiding going on before we went live on camera about an awards night that was held last week. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but at a chamber awards ceremony, um, Vice Mayor Koval has a couple of awards for the Santee Lakes Recreation Preserve, which she was able to garner, uh, Santee Favorites Award in Hospitality and Recreation, and also the 2022 Community Impact Award. So that's a positive for Santee Lakes and for her efforts. We also have another city council member who received a TDT construction from council member Trotter, received a Santee Favorites Award in the general contractor category. And on top of that, all three of our council member, vice mayor, and the city of Santee received an award for being in the chairman's circle for the chamber. So just uh, for those at home sitting around eating your popcorn, you got an award-winning team up here, and we really do appreciate all those efforts. We also have an event coming up this Saturday. Hold on a minute. we got to say the Santee Sheriff's. Oh, wait. Where? I was going to do him last, but that's oh, I'm okay. Sorry. Go right yeah, ahead. That's all right. So <laughs> Captain McNeil was able to garner a, and he was very happy to step up to the platform and collect an award as the best government, the favorite government entity being the San Diego Sheriff's Department. And we were very proud of you just jumping right in there, Cap. You did a great job. Um, This Saturday, the city is hosting a cleanup day, community cleanup day. It is here at City Hall. It runs from 8 o'clock until 12 o'clock. It's for household waste only. Um, Santee residents, please bring proof of residency. Uh, Each household is allowed to dispose of up to four items. And shredding is available for up to five banker boxes of old files and records that you just don't need anymore. So you can come to Santee City Hall on Saturday for our shred event. After you do that, you can go over to the lawn in front of the YMCA because the local Kiwanis Club is sponsoring a renaissance fair from 10 to 5 uh, with tournaments, archery, learn a craft or dance, and listen to a bardic recital. I don't know what that is, but they're having that anyway. Um, So that will be this Saturday over by the YMCA. And prior to our next city council meeting, there is an event that's going to be happening on the 1st of April. Uh, Our community services department is going to be putting on the Hop down the bunny trail. I'm looking at Nick over there because he's laughing at me, but that's okay. Um, It is 10 o'clock to 1 o'clock. Bring all your youngsters and have a great time over at Trolley Square. It's going to be a a fun day for everybody, and the Easter Bunny will be there to hand out goodies and also to take pictures. Uh, I'm kind of surprised our city council member Trotter did not mention his upcoming town hall, but we do have a town hall meeting here in this building on April the 25th. At 6 o'clock, it will be an opportunity for those in District 4 to be able to speak directly with their council member and get updates on some of the items that came before council tonight, as well as on our Arts and Entertainment District and other issues related to operations of the city within your district. So if you are in District 4, please remember to come here to Santee City Hall, 6 o'clock in the evening on April 25th, for a really great update and opportunity to meet with your elected official. The City of Santee is also putting out information I'll show the flyer up for the TV screen there. But it's a a flyer that talks about how the city communicates with our community. It has opportunities for you to look at how the city has information in uh, various meetings like this, also the methodologies that we use online, flyers that we put out. We want the community to be able to hear what's going on in our city, to be involved with what's going on in the city of Santee, and to be able to respond and integrate Um, and and, uh, activate yourselves with what's happening in our community. So if you want to look online, you can find that on our website. If you come to a city meeting, you can pick up a flyer. They're also available at the front offices here throughout City Hall. So you can find out what way you can actually communicate with your local government. And that's all I have, sir. Thank you. Thank you, City uh, City Attorney. Okay. Uh, You know, I want to thank everybody for being here tonight. We don't have a closed session report. Thanks, Council, for getting in the Padre gear. And uh, that's the next big event for me, probably, is opening day. So uh, having said that, go Padres. Meeting adjourned.